Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the appropriation bill for fiscal year 2024-2025. Mr. Speaker, this is the third budget presented by the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, the Honorable Member for Cassidy's East. Mr. Speaker, in football terms, the member for Cassidy's East has scored a hat trick. And this goal is even better than the first two, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we are well on our way to giving the opposition 5 nil. But more importantly, we are transforming and modernizing St. Lucia to improve the lives and livelihoods of our people. Mr. Speaker, July 26, 2021 will forever remain etched in the psyche of St. Lucians who could not wait to exile, who could not have waited to dislodge the incompetent and vindictive United Workers Party government led by the leader of the opposition and member for Miku South out of office. Mr. Speaker, the timing of this budget is at a critical juncture which provides us with an opportunity to evaluate the progress that our government has made and to determine the forward-looking policies our government needs to pursue over the next two years to achieve the vision, mission, goals, and objectives that we established in our manifesto. Mr. Speaker, our government is a results-oriented government, and therefore I will examine the available evidence, verifiable facts, and data to determine how well we have performed as a government. Mr. Speaker, I will not do like the opposition, who are famous for peddling distortions of the truth using mind-bending sophistry to fool St. Lucians using the latest Cambridge Analytica strategies and techniques. Mr. Speaker, our government is taking steps to fight the many-headed hydra of mis- and disinformation that the opposition is using to fool and deceive St. Lucians as they did in 2006. But it is not going to work this time because I am going to present irrefutable evidence to suggest that this government is solidly on course to take the people of this country to the promised land, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, honorable members are required to discuss the merits of the policies lucidly presented by the Minister of Finance, and more importantly, to evaluate the impact of those policies to determine whether they are having the desired impact on the economy, and most importantly, whether they are benefiting the people of St. Lucia. Moreover, Mr. Speaker, the budgetary policies announced by the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance must be viewed within the continuum of policies that have been previously implemented by our government, as these policies are, of course, complementary and fully supportive of achieving our manifesto commitments. It is therefore important, Mr. Speaker, to determine whether the current policies pursued by our government have been successful in achieving the goals and objectives of our government. Mr. Speaker, I will show that there is overwhelming evidence that our current policies are having a transformative and, may I say, a revolutionary impact on St. Lucia's economy. This, Mr. Speaker, is based on a suite of objective and verifiable results-based indicators used to gauge the performance of our policies. The measure I will use, Mr. Speaker, during my to assess our government's performance are as follows. One, economic growth. Two, labor market data on employment and unemployment. Three, fiscal performance. Four, tax policies and subsidies five, debt sustainability, and six, investment. After completing this review, Mr. Speaker, I will examine how the new budgetary policies will complement and support the previous people-centered policies geared at improving the lives and livelihoods of our people. 
These people-centered policies, Mr. Speaker, focus on improving economic growth and sustainable development by placing a strong focus on infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I would also like to point out from the outset that there is a major philosophical difference between the policies of our government and that of the former government. Mr. Speaker, we place greater emphasis on inclusiveness and equity to ensure that the people benefit directly from our policies, whereas the opposition's policies were based on failed neoclassical trickle-down economics in which the focus on people was secondary. Mr. Speaker, at this juncture, I will begin the current evaluation of our policies by reviewing the first performance measure, namely economic growth. Mr. Speaker, I wish to repeat that I will rely on objectively verifiable evidence and data. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, this is what the IMF had to say in its 2023 Article 4 consultation review. And this source can be found by using the following URL to download the IMF Article 4 consultation report. HTTPS colon slash slash www.imf.org. On page 9 of the Article 4 report under the caption Recent Economic Developments, the following was stated, and I quote, the economic recovery in 2022 was stronger than expected. Real GDP grew by 15.7% in 2022, driven by recovery in tourism and wholesale and retail trade." Unquote. I wish to emphasize, Mr. Speaker, that the IMF did not expect our economy to recover as quickly as it did, as the report states that economic growth was stronger than expected. We can therefore logically infer, Mr. Speaker, that the policies that our government implemented after July 26, 2021, have provided the impetus for a more robust, resilient, and stronger than expected economic recovery. Data in 2023 economic and social review shows that preliminary economic growth in 2023 was estimated at 2.2%. This compares with the IMF estimate of 3.2% as shown on page 4 of the press release issued by the IMF on March 8, 2024. I have reviewed Table 2 on page 104 of the Economic and Social Review, which provides the growth rate of the various industries. I am a bit perplexed, Mr. Speaker, I must say, by the contraction in the public administration, defense, and compulsory social security sector. You would observe, Mr. Speaker, that this sector is estimated to have contracted by 7.7%. And the cause for this contraction, based on the data presented in Table 2, is public education services, which contracted by 7.7%, and public health services, which also contracted by 7.7%. I am not aware, Mr. Speaker, that there were any contractions in public health and public education, as actual expenditures on these services did not contract. And so maybe there will be an opportunity for some clarification in that regard. I have also observed, Mr. Speaker, that the numbers for 2022 have been revised upwards from 18.1% to 20.4%, an increase of 2.3%, which makes the performance for 2022 even more impressive. I wish to note, Mr. Speaker, that the 2023 numbers are preliminary and will be subsequently reviewed by the Statistics Department. It was expected, Mr. Speaker, that economic growth would have slowed as we could not sustain a growth rate of 20.4%, of 20 but I am more inclined to go with the forecast of the IMF at this time, especially given the increase in job creation, which I shall address later in my presentation. I also note, Mr. Speaker, that the revised GDP figure of 2022, 2022 is higher than the corresponding figure for 2019. 
which is significant in that the records now show that we had fully recovered from COVID-19 in 2022, whereas the IMF had initially predicted that we would have fully recovered by 2024. This is a major milestone, Mr. Speaker, and deserves to be celebrated. We have recovered two years in advance of the initial projection, Mr. Speaker, thanks to the policies pursued by the member for Caswis East, an astute economist and finance expert. The reference table is table one on page 104 of the Economic and Social Review with the relevant role in GDP at market prices. In 2019, Mr. Speaker, GDP at market prices is 5.53 billion compared with the corresponding figure for 2022 of 5.62 billion. So Mr. Speaker, economic growth is definitely moving in the right direction. Moreover, Mr. Speaker, this performance took place in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we had to contend and are continuing to contend with the effects of the supply chain disruptions occasioned by the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the consequent global inflationary impact followed by increases in world interest rates. We now have to deal with the consequences of the ongoing Israel-Hamas conflict. Mr. Speaker, Lawrence H. Summers and N.K. Singh wrote in a recent article in Project Syndicate dated April 15, 2024, that the world is currently facing its worst five-year span in three decades. And developing countries like St. Lucia are particularly affected by the global economic and financial environment. On top of all of these challenges, Mr. Speaker, we have the wicked problem of climate change and all of its attendant adverse consequences, including more frequent and intense storms, higher temperatures, more intense droughts, and heavier than normal, rainfall. Mr. Speaker, given the turbulence in the world, this performance in St. Lucia is remarkable. So when I hear certain members speak about St. Lucia, I wonder where they are talking about an island that they had to build and they would be governing that island and that would have been the results of their own governance. But certainly, they are not speaking about St. Lucia under the leadership of the member for Caswis East. The second performance measure, Mr. Speaker, relates to how our policies have affected the labor market. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, I wish to draw your attention to Table 31 on page 124 of the Economic and Social Review as it relates to job creation. Mr. Speaker, the size of the employed labor force increased by 6,124 jobs, or 6.7%, 6 to 97,394. In other words, Mr. Speaker, the number of new jobs created on a net basis in 2023 was 6,124 jobs. Considering the size of our labor force, this is, by any measure, Mr. Speaker, a very significant and commendable achievement. The impact of this increase in employment resulted in the annual unemployment rate falling from 16.5% to 14%, matching the previous lowest unemployment rate in 2007. I note the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance said the second lowest unemployment rate, Mr. Speaker. But I verify this information by examining the labor, labor force data on the statistics website. The 2007 unemployment rate is recorded at 14%. It is instructive to note, Mr. Speaker, that the quarterly unemployment rates in 2023 were lower than every corresponding quarterly unemployment rate in 2022. I want to repeat, Mr. Speaker, that the quarterly 
unemployment rates in 2023 were lower than every corresponding quarterly unemployment rates in 2022. It means, Mr. Speaker, that we are systematically making progress in tackling the unemployment situation and generating significant employment in this country. In keeping with the drop in the overall unemployment rate, the youth unemployment rate fell from 26.8% to 25%, the lowest youth unemployment rate on record, Mr. Speaker. This shows clearly, Mr. Speaker, that our policies are working and this phenomenal achievement is indeed worthy of celebration. But Mr. Speaker, our government will not rest. We will continue in that restless search for the solutions to the problems that tantalize us. We will indeed strive to do even better by bringing unemployment down to single digits, by further growing the economy, and more importantly, providing high quality and well-paying jobs. So, Mr. Speaker, the second performance measure, namely unemployment, is most certainly trending in the right direction. We constantly hear the refrain of the opposition that the economy is stagnant <coughs> and that there are no jobs being created. Obviously, the evidence have clearly refuted this particular argument. We need to ask them, Mr. Speaker, what is the source of their data? But I know the answer, Mr. Speaker. It is Cambridge Analytica. Mr. Speaker, there is no doubt that it will continue to spread misinformation and disinformation. But we need to ensure that all solutions are given access to accurate information provided by official sources and to refute the bogus information that they will continue to peddle. This is important, Mr. Speaker. As we are aware that the opposition is using the most advanced psychological mind-bending techniques aimed at convincing St. Lucians of their sophistry, we must fight this virtual war of propaganda to expose the subterfuge deployed by the mercenaries. The third performance measure I wish to highlight, Mr. Speaker, is the fiscal performance of the government. This measure is important, Mr. Speaker, because government expenditure is used for providing the important goods and services for its citizens, including education, health, security, infrastructure, and other support services and revenues and loans provided the source of financing for these services. We need to ensure, in particular, Mr. Speaker, that our fiscal policies are strong and sound as large deficits contribute to unsustainable debt levels and to increasing amount of our revenues going to service our debt in the future. In keeping with the need to review objective, verifiable data, Mr. Speaker, I wish to draw your attention to page 126, table 33 of the 2023 Economic and Social Review. This table shows, Mr. Speaker, that the overall fiscal deficit as a percentage of GDP has improved substantially from a deficit of 11.6% in fiscal year 2020-2021, narrowing to 5.4% in fiscal year 2021-2022, and further to 1.9% in the fiscal year 2022-2023. In the fiscal year 2023-2024, the fiscal deficit has stabilized at 1.9% in fiscal year 2023-2024 and is reflective of our government's policy to ensure fiscal stability as a precursor for sustainable economic growth and development. Mr. Speaker, that's how any responsible and sensible Minister for Finance deal with the business of the economy because we need a sound macroeconomic framework to be able to deliver increased services to the people of the country. We have also taken significant steps, Mr. Speaker, to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of government expenditure to ensure that we reduce waste, cost overruns, and ensure that government expenditure generates significant value 
to the economy and people of St. Lucia. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, I have had to take steps to review the St. Jude Hospital project and the Hiwanora Airport Rehabilitation and Expansion Project to prevent the spiraling cost overruns that would have resulted had we continued with these projects. Mr. Speaker, we will not do like the former administration and waste millions of dollars by building a redundant road to facilitate a horse racing track, wasting monies on vaccines that we are yet to receive, <laughs> buying incinerators which we cannot use, relocating the Boseju farm, giving an investor millions for putting artificial turf on our playing fields. The so-called four-lane highway at Rodney Bay, which had no designs, and the list goes on and on, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have made significant progress in improving our fiscal performance. The fourth measure is tax policy and subsidies. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, we have heard the opposition, led by its leader, the member for Miku South, refer to St. Lucia as being overtaxed given that the government has implemented the health and security levy. He has also conveniently requested that government reduce the price of petroleum products and reduce the import duties and other taxes on goods as a means of reducing inflation. In other words, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition is advocating for a major reduction in revenue, resulting in a widening of the deficit an increase in our debt. Whatever he's asking us to do will lead to a reduction in revenue and a widening of the deficit and increase in our debt. Mr. Speaker, this is precisely the reason why the public should never ever make that mistake of returning them to the corridors of power. Mr. Speaker, our government has given careful consideration to its tax reform strategy and has provided substantial income tax relief by increasing the personal income tax allowance from $18,000 to $25,000 and reducing the number of income tax bonds from four to three bonds. This tax reform measure is significant, particularly to low-income earners, as it means that anyone earning up to $2,083 monthly will pay no income tax, resulting in an additional 15,000 paying no income tax. The personal income tax allowance combined with the restructuring of the income tax bonds has resulted in two thirds of St. Lucian's paying less income tax. I repeat, Mr. Speaker, and I challenge the best political liar to refute that particular statement. The personal income tax allowance, combined with the restructuring of the income tax bonds, has resulted in two-thirds of St. Lucians paying less income tax. This, Mr. Speaker, will result in an increase in the disposable incomes of those individuals. So we are we not in the business of overtaxing people. We are in a strategic reform, a strategic reform to generate revenues to finance our expenditure. The government has continued its tax amnesty, waiving interest on penalties on major taxes collected by the Inland Revenue Department. Moreover, in an effort to stimulate the construction and the housing sectors, Mr. Speaker, the government has waived the value-added tax on plywood, lumber, steel, cement, and galvanized for a period of two years with effect from July 2023. Our government has also provided major tax concessions in the renewable energy sector. We've selected PV components placed in the zero-rated VAT category and that the cost and installation of a PV system will be allowed as a tax deductible over a maximum two-year period. This is a progressive government, Mr. Speaker. The government has also provided a rebate of $1 per gallon fuel purchase 
by registered fishers. The government also continues to subsidize the cost of LPG and rice, flour, and sugar to the tune of millions of dollars. Notwithstanding these major tax relief measures, Mr. Speaker, the government has recognized that there is a deficit in financing health and national security, two critical pillars of sustainable development. As a result, Mr. Speaker, the government implemented a health and security levy of 2.5% to provide additional financing for these two critical areas. In doing so, Mr. Speaker, our government has taken steps to minimize the impact on the cost of living by exempting critical items, including food and pharmaceutical items, from the levy, Mr. Speaker. This is a government with a conscience. This is a government that is easing the squeeze on the people of this country. It is clear, Mr. Speaker, that our policies on tax reform and subsidies provide a net benefit to the people of this country. Mr. Speaker, I repeat, our policies on tax reform and subsidies provide a net benefit to the people of St. Lucia. This hypocritical outcry by the leader of the opposition and his acolytes is again a major failed attempt of trying to convince the people that they are overtaxed. Mr. Speaker, a measure of whether an economy is overtaxed is the tax to GDP ratio, which measures how much tax revenue is collected in relation to the size of the economy. In St. Lucia's case, Mr. Speaker, the tax to GDP ratio is 18.4%. The reference for this, Mr. Speaker, is Table 33 of the Economic and Social Review. The range for tax to GDP ratios ranges from a low of 10% in Indonesia to figures as high as 35% some countries in the European Union. So, Mr. Speaker, while St. Lucia is not the lowest, it is by no means close to the highest. The fifth performance measure I wish to focus on, Mr. Speaker, is public debt, and in particular, the sustainability of public debt. The leader of the opposition, in cahoots with his apostles, has been attempting to do hoodwink St. Lucia by attempting to discredit our debt management and borrowing policies. This government, ably led by a fiscal and debt savvy Minister for Finance, understands the importance of debt sustainability. And we have taken important steps to bring down the public debt as a percentage of GDP from an unsustainably high level of 93.2% in 2020 to 69.5% in 2022. In 2023, Mr. Speaker, the debt to GDP ratio rose modestly to 72.9%. Mr. Speaker, in my contribution to the 2024-2025 estimates debate, I spent some time on discrediting the subterfuge and false propaganda being spread by the opposition and highlighted that the single greatest contributor to our future public debt is the Hiwanora airport project. Mr. Speaker, the former government led by the member for Mikusa borrowed close to 600 million for this project. This irresponsible act has jeopardized our debt sustainability and we now need to take measures to safeguard our future by undertaking prudent fiscal policies that will ensure that we create the fiscal space to facilitate the future investment needs to sustain growth and development. <clears throat> Our government, Mr. Speaker, responsible with public debt management as reflected by implementing the Public Debt Management Act. We are on the right path on debt sustainability and will only take cost correction based on the evolution of our key macroeconomic aggregates in the medium term.
The sixth performance measure I wish to highlight is investment. Mr. Speaker, a good measure of investment is the level of construction activity taking place in the economy. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, I wish to point out that the construction sector was the sector contributing the most to our GDP growth in 2023, expanding significantly by 19.3%. Page 23 of the Economic and Social Review states, and I quote, activity in the construction sector received a boost from ongoing and new projects in both the public and private sectors. Private sector projects featured an acceleration of works on major tourism-related projects, such as the Marriott Hotel and others, Mr. Speaker. Construction activity is estimated to have picked up in the public sector as some central government projects advance, such as the Millennium Highway, West Coast upgrades, and some new projects by statutory bodies broke ground in 2023. I invite honorable members to review pages 30 and 31 of the Economic and Social Review to see some of the construction projects being implemented. Mr. Speaker, we therefore enter the year of infrastructure with an already significant momentum in construction activity. I repeat, Mr. Speaker, we are entering the year of infrastructure with a momentum in, in construction activity. Significantly, Mr. Speaker, it must be pointed out on the same page in the Economic and Social Review that the cost of some building materials fell during the course of the year due partly to the incentives or waiver of VAT on selected construction materials. I mentioned earlier and this would have contributed to the boost in construction. It is therefore clear, Mr. Speaker, that our policies for stimulating the construction sector are working and are having the desired impact in terms of increasing economic growth and employment. Having established that our government policies have been successful by a review of six performance measures I will now address the budget policies contained in the budget for the fiscal period 2024 to 2025 and to show how they are aligned and complementary to our current policies and will contribute to the sustained economic growth and development and more importantly benefit our people directly. You see all those measures putting the economy in good health it's not just for the sake of good figures, Mr. Speaker. It means that if it is in good health, it's going to be in a position to take care of the citizens in a much better fashion. Our government has designated the current fiscal year as the year of infrastructure. As the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance has eloquently articulated, investing in traditional physical infrastructure such as roads, bridges and water while extremely important, is simply not enough. If we are to increase economic growth, enhance social development and improve the environment, we need to invest more, Mr. Speaker, in digital infrastructure, social infrastructure, cultural infrastructure, sporting infrastructure, and infrastructure for law and order and good governance, Mr. Speaker. It's a holistic restructuring of the economy of the country. It is instructive to note, Mr. Speaker, the origins of the word infrastructure, which was first used by a group of French engineers to refer to a complex set of systems to enable a society's functioning. The first use of the word infrastructure by a group of French engineers to refer to a complex set of systems to enable a society's functioning. Mr. Speaker, Infrastructure investment provides for the long-term needs of a country with such projects requiring or providing services to our people for a very long time. Indeed, these projects usually cost significant sums of money, and we must therefore ensure that a proper feasibility of these projects is undertaken. 
so that we do not build white elephants. The Prime Minister has announced a series of projects that will complement the ongoing projects being implemented. These include investments in roads, in bridges, the new hall of justice, the police headquarters, digital infrastructure, sporting facilities including tennis courts, an Olympic-sized swimming pool, Darren, Sami National Cricket Ground, the rehabilitation of the Judge Odlum National Stadium, wellness centers, and community centers. In addition, it is expected that work on some major projects, including the St. Jude's Hospital Redevelopment Project, the Hiwanora Airport Project, the West Coast Road and Millennium Highway, and the Northern Police Divisional Headquarters will be accelerated during the fiscal year 2024-2025. All of these projects, Mr. Speaker, are expected to contribute to significant economic, social, law and order, cultural, sporting and environmental development. The budget for fiscal year 2024-2025 provides significant benefits for the people of St. Lucia. In the interest of time, Mr. Speaker, I can only highlight some of the major ones. One of the flagship policies announced in the budget, geared at improving the real wages of low-income earners, is the implementation of a minimum living wage, slated to be implemented in August 2024. This will provide significant benefits for thousands of St. Lucians who find it difficult to subsist on their current wages. I would also like to mention, Mr. Speaker, the policies for pensioners who find it difficult to make ends meet, especially those who receive small pensions. The policy by the government to increase the minimum government pension to $700 and NIC to increase the minimum pension to $500 effective August 1st, 2024 will go a long way to assist those who receive as little as $300 a month. Moreover, Mr. Speaker, Government has announced that government pensions will increase in line with wage increases granted to public servants and thus maintain their real wages. Mr. Speaker, this is a government with a soul. And the policies of this government have a soul. And they are going to be durable, Mr. Speaker. And it is on the basis of our policies that the opposition realize that the ship is sinking in the rising tide of progress in this country. In the interest of time, Mr. Speaker, I will simply list the other beneficial measures for the people of St. Lucia. These include, Mr. Speaker, a macro investment bill to fast track investments once they meet the relevant technical criteria. I remember in Singapore, they would have a series of investments awaiting investors. They have some investment areas that they want to attract foreign direct investment into. And within 24 hours, you would know if it's approved. Because revelation comes to the prepared mind. And we must always be prepared, Mr. Speaker, to know what investment we need and those, of course, that would be detrimental to us. Special incentives to business and property owners in the city to renovate and refurbish properties as part of government's urban renewal strategy. Brilliant. Relief to banana farmers affected by shortage of boxes and packaging material entitled to a shed compensation amounting to $500,000. Public officers are to be eligible for 100% mortgages under the US $20 million from the Exim Bank facility to be administered by the St. Lucia Development Bank. Import duty on hybrid vehicles to remain at 5% up to November 2025. Continuation of the amnesty on waiver of penalties and interest on outstanding taxes administered by the Inland Revenue Department for an additional year up to May 2025. 
continuation of the waiver of residential property taxes for an additional year up to May 1st, 2025, and waiver of stamp duty up to 400,000 on house mortgages as part of government's policy to encourage new residential homes and renovation of existing homes. Mr. Speaker, this is unheard of. As we rebuild in the aftermath of COVID, Mr. Speaker, whilst the world is going through a tough time, we are growing this economy. We are stabilizing the economy to deliver more to the people of this country and have list so many things that will benefit the people of this country, including my constituents. All those national policies impact positively on the people that I represent. Mr. Speaker, the budget for fiscal year 2024-2025 continues to build on the excellent policies that have been implemented in fiscal years 2023-2024 and 2022-2023, ensuring sustained economic growth, increased employment and a corresponding reduction in unemployment, fiscal and financial stability, increase foreign investment, improve law and order, social development and environmental sustainability. Mr. Speaker, only one without conscience will not consent to this appropriation bill. Mr. Speaker, I would like to change gears at this juncture. Having scrutinized what the Prime Minister has presented as the major engine that will ensure that the people that I represent in Labri Oje will finally receive the share of the national cake. Our sidewalks in Oje shall continue to St. Jude's Hospital. We are going to light the Oje playing ground, fence the Oje playing ground. We are going to light and fence the Olibo playing ground. As we speak, Mr. Speaker, crossover is experiencing some upgrade. Mr. Speaker, the people of Kate, the people of Kate have remained hopeful. And this time, this time, Mr. Speaker, this time around, I want to assure the people of Kate that our road construction shall start at Kate. During this fiscal period, I am pleased, Mr. Speaker, that the library market square is under construction. Majomel, this beautiful part of our constituency. And if you go back to my bio video before elections, I actually took it by the Majomel waterfalls. We are opening up the lands at Majomel for proper development. We have two major waterfalls. And some guy already built a nice villa right in the interior to take advantage of a new type of tourism. You see, in Labri, we embrace our own strain of, of tourism. We have been doing our thing over time. We have been growing our Airbnb products. And before that market becomes saturated, we are planning the next phase where we graduate to something brand new, but we are continuing the process in a very quiet way without no fuss and fanfare. Mr. Speaker, they have to remain optimistic in terms of what is before us. In terms of the lands at POM, at Black Bay, the surveys are ongoing. And very soon, the people of Black Bay, Oje, will get the justice that they deserve. And I do not want this term to be concluded without those people getting title to those lands. Because if we allow sunset to come, then there will be a miscarriage of justice. It will be a miscarriage of justice. The people of Pom, Black Bay, and Oje are going to get title to their lands at concessionary rates as articulated in the manifesto, Mr. Speaker. 
This is, not, this is something which is not subject to debate or compromise. Mr. Speaker, I know that a lot needs to be done in my constituency. And when the Labour Party gets into office, we do not only have to deal with situations in our strongholds like Labry and Beaufort North, but we have to deal with the neglect island-wide. And any man or woman with conscience will distribute the pie. We, in the constituency of Labry Ogier, we're not asking for preferential treatment. All we ask for is to help us catch up with matters of development, matters of infrastructural development and otherwise. We are developing ourselves and our community in the way that we deem necessary. We built the Labri Cooperative Credit Union, which is expanding rapidly, Mr. Speaker. We not souffre with the sulfur springs and the pitons. We do not have vast amount of resources, but we were able to be creative to grow this credit union through blood, sweat, and tears. I remember many nights, late nights, yours truly, serving on the board with the great, the great architects of the constituency of Labry, people like the great Watson Louis, Senator for Life, Agatha Japanel, the great Hilary Dajeville and Rudy John, who have migrated to the silent continents of eternity. Man, man, man. For many late nights, we volunteered our time to grow our credit union. And you know, whilst we were doing that, there were persons who were trying to discourage others from becoming members of the cooperative union. But we persevered, Mr. Speaker. I recall when we were on the Labry Youth and Sports Council, Ambassador Julian Dubois and I, with, along with other young people, we went by the market every Saturday with forms, with a loudspeaker we got from the Honorable Valen John with a little horn, and we, are in, we were encouraging people to join. And many young people joined during that time. We obtained sponsorship from the Labry Cooperative Credit Union and we were able to grow our credit union in a responsible fashion. So we are used to doing things for ourselves. But as taxpayers, we need some of our tax monies to go into the development of the constituency of Labry Oje. And Laborians know full well that under the United Workers Party, they will get nothing. And I will emphasize, before I close, Mr. Speaker, that not only that we were neglected by the United Workers Party when in office, we are celebrating 50 years this year as a separate constituency. 30 of those years have been under the United Workers Party. And we got absolutely nothing during that time. As a matter of fact, anything that was slated for my constituency would be stopped including the library market the last time. Monies were in the budget, in two consecutive budgets. And they removed it completely. And for five years, remained frozen in the currents of vindictiveness. Remember, you have 10 minutes left. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as soon as this angel from Cassius East came in, he put the library market in the budget. And it, it, it started this year not because of political delays, but because of the bureaucratic processes that had to give birth to the commencement of the project. But we are happy, Mr. Speaker. There is a thunderclap of acceptance of this project, although it has started on many on the other side of saying, Ipakai fini. But I can guarantee you, Mr. Speaker, that we Laborians will continue to organize ourselves into that integrated whole, and we shall continue to build our constituency. And government is just one of the actors in the drama of development. We will always be in the forefront of our own development, because we are in control of our own destiny. And I want to, of course, express 
my heartfelt gratitude to the people of Labri Oje for making me the instrument of their wishes. And this is why I will always do my best under very trying circumstances, face the good, the bad, and the ugly to ensure that I pay the price for being on this earth and for being in politics, which is not a bed of roses. You see, some people believe it's a vocation they come in on in politics. Politics has no rest and no thank you. Although, Mr. Speaker, many times I am in my constituency office, half of the people who come to see me, they come to say thank you. They come to say thank you. And some of them is not even the direct recipients, but sometimes members of the family. And as we are doing the sidewalks in Oje, I am getting text messages from young people, the older people in the, in the constituency, from all walks of life. It is a project that they welcome and embrace. And only under a St. Lucia Labour Party, we are going to get our fair share of the national pie. Mr. Speaker, I had to give careful and sensible treatment to my ministry, but time would not permit me to do so because I need about three hours to speak about the achievements of my ministry. And I know that if I try to confine the, the, the achievements to that one hour, I will not do justice to most of the missions and the work of my ministry. I rather suspect, Mr. Speaker, that I will package those achievements and, of course, come to the House and speak to it in a minister's statement. So, Mr. Speaker, as I prepare to close, I want to commend the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, the member for Casuist East, for a well-crafted policy statement, one that is pregnant with possibilities. And I join my friend from Babuno in saying that it will give birth to great things for the people of this country. I just invite all St. Lucians to remain on board and to fasten your seatbelts as we continue to navigate successfully in the turbulent global environment. We must trust an experienced captain. The member for Cassius East, he has actually navigated in bad weather before. And he is taking this country to a place unknown to the imagination of the critics, unknown to the imagination of many in this country. He will continue, in the words of Dr. Miles Monroe, he will continue to challenge the tide of convention, stretch the boundaries of tradition, and violate the expectations of the norm. Mr. Speaker, I thank you for allowing me to make this brief intervention. And at this juncture, I yield the floor.